Well, good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to Cardiff. Uh, great to see you all here. We have um, we've broken the record this year with 183 delegates, so that's um, great news. And a year or two to come, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll get through the 200 barrier. Um, it's the first time that the NBN conference has uh, been to Wales, and um, uh, I think we've got a, a program that is uh, diverse and I, I hope very entertaining over the next two days, um, with the odd other event thrown in, like the the AGM and the award ceremony. Um, <clears throat> The format for the conference is very similar to last year. Uh, it seemed to go down uh, very well then. Uh, and the only real difference this year is that for the first time, we're going to be incorporating the annual general meeting into the conference. And uh, this will follow on from the, the main program today between the end of the, the afternoon's proceedings and the start of the award ceremony. The idea of having the AGM here, it's, it's high time we did that, I think, um, is that we can make the business of the NBN Trust more open to the network in general. Um, and we'll give information at the, uh, at the AGM um, on the NBN, NBN governance review <coughs> that we've uh, carried out and that is leading to the uh, restructuring of the board. Um, and we'll also give an, uh, uh, a recap on um, the NBN membership review that has been carried out this year <clears throat> and an update on our business priorities from the NBN action plan. Um, you're, of course, not obliged to attend the AGM. I hope you will do so. You're, you're all invited to come along. Um, it's an opportunity to... Um, hear more about the network business. All delegates who are uh, representing their <coughs> member organization uh, at the AGM will, will have the right to vote. And if you haven't already done so, please see the NBN secretariat um, at lunchtime um, on the registration desk if you're here to vote, and they'll give you the necessary voting paperwork. Um, there are a number of other things I should quickly mention at the outset. Uh, there are details of all the presentations and room for notes in the printed brochure, which um, I think you'll agree with me is, um, is a, a, a superb production. There's also Twitter and hash hashtag information on the inside cover, and there are Twitter handles for each presenter, so everyone can, can join in with the proceedings. There'll also be Twitter boards on the stage somewhere. Um, and uh, also, uh, please keep your brochure and your name badge uh, throughout the conference. Also, um, as I think you've been forewarned via email, we're recording um, the presentations, so they will be accessible from the NBN website. And this means I should um, uh, make people aware that your voices may be heard if you ask any questions, um, although only the presenters will actually be seen on the video. Um, uh, we are also going to use Facebook Live for the keynote addresses and the Sir John Burnett Memorial Lecture, so this will be live streamed through the NBN Facebook page. So, Simon, no pressure. Um, finally, I should mention that um, you have already uh, signed up, I believe, for the workshops this afternoon and been sent an email reminder. But if you can't recall which one you're joining, then um, please see one of the NBM team or check on the um, registration desk. It's it's. It's going to be important that you join the correct workshop because space is um, is limited in in some of the some of the rooms where the workshops are being held. So once uh, again, uh, welcome from me. Uh, I do hope you have a very enjoyable and inf interesting um, conference, 
And um, I will now hand you over to uh, the chair of the morning uh, session, uh, one of our trustees, uh, Jen Ashworth. Thank you, morning everyone. Um, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, you'll have found the toilets hopefully in the restaurant. Um, if you were here at half nine, you'll have heard the weekly fire alarm test. So if that you do hear another fire alarm, it is, um, it's, it's not the test basically. The, you'll see there are um, fire exits at the back and the sides. Um, so please follow them and assemble at the side of the museum or at the back of the museum and then staff will help us at that point. Um, Right, on to this morning's session. Um, we are focusing on progress and partnership of the MBN. Um, we're going to start with our keynote address, um, and then we're going to have a look at what progress has been achieved at the NBN across the UK, um, then focus on Scotland, um, and then we're going to have tea and coffee break, and then we'll move on to a couple of presentations about Wales, um, which is obviously particularly important as we are here in beautiful Cardiff. Um, and then we will look at what we can work together on as verification. And then it will be lunchtime, so it should be a really stimulating morning. Um, we'll get on with the talks now, and we're first of all going to start with our keynote address um, from Professor Simon Leather. He is a Professor of Entomology at Harper Adams University, um, and is particularly um, interested in kind of outreach and engaging, um, engaging the wider community, which is why he's going to talk to us um, about using Twitter. Um, so I'll hand over to you to explain and give your talk. Thank you very much. Great. OK, good uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to the NBN for inviting me along to come and speak to you this morning. Um, I should warn you that this, there are no data, well, there are some data in this uh, talk, but it's not a data talk. It's having been to a um, conference uh, about children's literature uh, the weekend before last, this talk is going to be about contextualizing the narrative of how a middle-aged Luddite, who uh, until five years ago didn't have a mobile phone, and now only has one like this, uh, and it, is, it has no intention of converting any further, became uh, a fan of Twitter. So this is basically a personal story. It's about why, why I think Twitter's great and why I think social media is where we should all be uh, looking at. Uh, there's a lot of social media out there. Uh, I'm only going to talk about Twitter. Uh, many of you may be on other social media platforms, uh, but Twitter is what I'm going to talk about, it's what I know most about, and I'll also mention uh, blogging at the same time. Uh, so it's going to be, first of all, as I said, this is a personal narrative, so it's about how it all began before I sort of hit the Twitter sphere. So it's going to be about what I do, why I do it, and then I'm going to talk about the outcomes and perhaps the, what I see as the benefits of having exposed myself uh, to social media, including Facebook Live. Uh, so, uh, I've always been an entomologist. The old cliche goes, you know, since I was knee high to a grasshopper, I've been an entomologist. You can see the little butterfly there. And I, I was an entomologist as a student. And if anybody had asked that long haired guy if he'd one day be professor of entomology, he would have laughed at you. But here he is. Uh, so, the other thing is that I've always sort of been applied. So, at once, and I've always wanted to sort of help people. Uh, so it's why I went into an applied field and I sort of, um, I guess, uh, worked. It's why I ended up in crop protection and conservation because I sort of see that as helping the world, helping the people. And having tried medical school, I decided that wasn't the way to go, that the best way of helping people was to look after the environment. Uh, so having been applied and always sort of feeling that what you're doing should be out there for what we now call the end user, uh, but in th those days we'd have called the grower or the farmer. I always felt it was really important that you should tell people what you're doing and make it accessible. So this was my first attempt when I was uh, working in Finland, uh, designing uh, an aphid forecasting scheme. And this is me explaining to Finnish farmers and the Finnish equivalent of Farmers Weekly why this forecasting scheme was a good thing for them to sign up to. And it's a source of, I guess, personal pleasure and pride to me that 40, almost 40 years on, this is a system that they still use. 
so, but I've also also been involved in sort of promulgating, trying to get people to uh, take notice of what we do as scientists. And looking at my editing career, uh, I noticed that I actually started off very much sort of in the outreach thing. So I, when I worked for the Forestry Commission, I used to edit a thing called Enterpath News, which was to tell the foresters what we in entomology and pathology were actually doing in research and how it applied to their jobs. And then I ended up in Ant Antenna, which was the sort of general outreach for ENTSOC members. And then I seem to have got more specialised and talking to peers, editing things for, for our peers, the, the, the sort of journals. So getting away from outreach. Uh, and the other thing I do and have done for 25 years now is train future entomologists in skills that's ranging from identification to research. And um, so that's to me is really important, getting a, a cadre of people out there who can identify things and collect data of, of our most important animal groups. Uh, but, you know, it sort of occurred to me that, although this is useful, it's a bit limited in scope, that most of the world out there, uh, especially if you're an entomologist, looks like they're really vertebrate-centric, especially mammal-centric. The, the 4,588 species of mammal that exist in the world receive a lot more attention than the 30 million insects. Uh, so, yes, there are quite a few entomologists, and we've got aspiring entomologists, but it sort of doesn't re isn't really representative of the data we could be collecting, of the people that are out there that should be working on particular disciplines. And this sort of ignorance of entomology has bugged me for a long time, uh, and the sort of things that started to get my um, blood pressure up are these sort of perceptions and misconceptions that are out there, that insects to most people are either something you stamp on or swat, or they pollinate. And they do so much more than that. And people are abysmally ignorant. Really educated people know so little about entomology. So as a Guardian reader, this is hilariously funny. As an entomologist, I find this wince-worthy. You know, there's, the anatomy is wrong, you know, apart from the fact they can't talk to each other uh, in that way. But, you know, and this starts at a really young age. So you get top trumps. The first thing that I, as a British entomologist, sort of cringe and wince is the fact it's called bugs. To a British entomologist, bugs are a particular group. They're the hemiptera. Okay. Give it the juice, say they're marketing for Americans where bugs are insects. Uh, you open it up, what have you got? Scorpions and wood lice. Okay, they've got chitinous exoskeletons, but they are not insects in any sort of thing of the world. And then they've got bloody earthworms and leeches. Sorry, earthworm watch. Uh, but they are, they are not insects. They're about as related to, to insects as, uh, I don't know, we are to... Um, Jellyfish, I don't know, you know, it's, well, slightly less low, but, you know, it's just so annoying. My blood pressure goes up all the time. Uh, and you get things, so recently you will have seen uh, people saying we should have a GCSE in natural history. But we've been talking about this for a long time. And as Mark Spencer said way back in 2010, you know, yes, it's a good idea, but who's going to teach it? So many teachers are scared of the natural world, of insects. They can't identify things. You know, what are we going to do about it? And then things like this really, really do make my blood boil and make me want to swear. Here's an educated person writing in a public newspaper, disgusting hoverflies, hoover them up despite knowing that they're harmless. I really hate insects. You know, how can people go around saying that? It's just so ignorant. It's so annoying. Uh, so my blood pressure for the last... So up, you know, up till 2010, 2011, 2012, I, I'm seeing more and more of this, and I'm getting more and more annoyed, and I'm complaining and saying somebody should do something about it. And then I thought, well, if it's not me, who's going to do it? If not now, when? So I started uh, to up my outreach. Uh, so I started, instead of waiting to be asked to talk at uh, places, I started to sort of, you know, put my name out on public speaker networks and things like that. 
so that I could actually get out there and talk to people about how important it was to know about the invertebrate world, uh, about the small things really matter. Going into schools, trying to get across to them that, you know, polar bears and pandas are irrelevancies. You know, insects are where it's all at. You, got, you know, you've got to look at things uh, in a different way. Uh, I've been involved with the Prince's Teaching Institute, so trying to help newly qualified biology teachers work out how to bring biodiversity into their curricula in the places they've got, how they can use their school grounds to get children to interact with nature and to think about what's out there. I, I usually walk around advertising with t-shirts at conferences, but I decided Wales was probably too cold, so you just have to see the pictures. Um, and any opportunity to meet the public, I was taking that, you know, having open days, doing things like that. Uh, supporting the next generation. So I was very pleased that I was able to sort of help uh, publicize that young people do enjoy entomology. Uh, she was a very precocious uh, eight-year-old at the time. Now she's getting ready to go to university. Um, and, you know, occasionally I would get some press coverage. You'd occasionally get a little sort of bit in a newspaper. Uh, uh, but then I sort of looked at what I was doing. I'm thinking, I'm doing a lot of words. I'm doing a lot of writing. But I'm preaching to, in some cases, the converted. And I'm preaching to sort of other scientists, to other sort of academics. I need a wider audience. I need to get out there and how do I get this out to, you know, to the world. And so I felt, okay, it's probably time for something different, but what am I going to do? And then one of my PhD students, Francisca Sconce, said to me, you should be on social media. And I said, what? And she said, you know, Twitter. And I said, no, no, Twitter's all about the Kardashians, whoever they are, and kittens and gerbils running around on things. And she said, no, no, th there's science out there. That's where science is happening now. Uh, so I said, OK. So with some trepidation, I sort of launched a Twitter account. I was really excited to find that nobody had stolen the Twitter handle Entoprof. So, so that was, that was a, a, a great uh, boon, because at the time, I was the only professor of entomology in the UK. Um, and I also. A couple of months later, launched a blog, and this sort of represents uh, my interest in the stuff that lives on roundabouts, uh, which are great nature reserves. Um, so, sort of, what was the rationale besides Fran sort of bullying me into going onto Twitter? So, the th things that sort of swung it for me was this opportunity of increasing the outreach, sort of getting it out there to a bigger audience. So, you know, um, you write papers. You've got however many pe people read your papers, which mainly sort of up your peers. You go to a conference, you know, you might have a, an audience this sort of size. You talk in schools, you've got 30 people. Talk in a natural history society, depending on uh, the natural history society, it could be 10 people you're talking to, or maybe 30 if you're at a bigger one. So you're not really getting a huge reach for your effort. Twitter. Uh, I just put a, uh, a tweet on this morning at 6.30, just as a test, saying I was getting ready for the things. And within 10 minutes, I'd had 50 people reading that uh, tweet. And I've just checked it now. And every, every minute, two people are, are looking at it. So there's reach going on there straight away. So it's, it was a, it's a great way of widening your outreach. I also wanted to improve interactions, talk to more people. You can meet people on Twitter, believe it or not. Uh, and the blog, I did that for writing practice, because as a scientist, you tend to do things in a, your, your prose style is, is, is different. Um, so I wanted, to, so my sort of retirement plans, uh, which are growing nearer and nearer, is to actually get a few popular science books out there, extolling the virtues of biodiversity and insects out there. So it's good writing practice. And of course, you know, it is enjoyable. So there's, a, there's pleasure coming out of that. There are challenges. Finding the time. I do have a full-time job. But luckily, part of my job is outreach. So I can justify some of the time I spend on social media. 
Coming up with ideas. I try to write a blog article every 12 days. So you've got to come up with a new idea. Uh, but it works. They generate new ideas. Uh, one big worry was sort of, I'm exposing myself to a big audience. And I'm doing it as me. I'm not hiding under some nom de plume like um, uh, whatever, you know, uh, I don't know, any, any nom de plume. I'm there as me. Uh, and you also sort of need a little bit of carrot and stick to sort of give you that impetus. But I find it's rewarded in enough in itself to do it. <clears throat> so that takes you on to, has this sort of jump into social media been a useful exercise? And it has. It's been great. So this is just, these were the people I met really early on. I knew Luke already, uh, who's the outreach officer for the Royal Ensoc. But I bumped, bumped into Twitter on, with Kate Long, who... Uh, if I had a, ha, ever heard of her, she's an author who writes these bad children's handbooks and ha, as sort of writes films. But it turns out she's the uh, vol recorder for Shropshire and part of the Whitchurch Natural History Society. So I got involved with them. Uh, Minnie Beast Mayhem, never heard of her until I went onto Twitter. She's a lady who goes out into schools, talking to school, uh, junior primary schools and now secondary schools, about how wonderful invertebrates are. And Maya Leonard, who some of you may have heard about, who's now a best-selling children's author, uh, with Beetle Boy, Beetle Queen, Battle of the Beatles, uh, and she interacts, we interact, we, we're doing things together. She, uh, it's, it's great. To, there's all these people out here that I would never have met without going onto Twitter. And professionally, for those of you who think, well, you're just wasting your time doing outreach. Well, the professional links have been incredible. I've met so many people that I might have heard of, but I would never have dreamt of actually interacting with at a personal level in terms of research and collaborations. So it's been a, a huge success that way, actually getting out there, meeting people and interacting with people. And it's also given me the opportunity to more publicly fight against what I see as a vertebrate bias. <laughs> Apologies to anybody who collects vertebrate data. Uh, so. My favorite target was the journal called Animal Conservation, who seem to think that the word animal means they're a bit like Radio 4 uh, people, that an animal is a bird or a mammal, and that insects aren't animals. Uh, and I had some heated debates with them. And as a result, they allowed me to uh, write something in their journal. Uh, so that, that, was a, that was a win. Uh, also, Mini Beast Mayhem and I sort of uh, had a go at BBC Wildlife Mag. Those of you who take it will know that in about the last 15 years, they've had two insects on the front cover. Uh, it's always tigers or polar bears. So we had a go at them. And they, they allowed us to have a little, um, a little bit of a debate in their journal about this and set out a poll. So that was a success. To me, that, 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 that worked. We did something. And we've had some, even, you know, we want the younger generation to be involved in data collection, in nature recording, in biodiversity initiatives. So this is a direct result of Twitter. Without Twitter, we would never have had EntoSci 16. So this was a conference specifically for 14 to 18-year-olds uh, to get them involved and interested in invertebrates. Insects mainly, but the allied things. And this was such a great success that the ENTSOC, who helped fund this, are again helping us fund ENTOSI 18. And, you know, it's, it's wonderful that this happened because of going out on social media. <coughs> so the other thing, of course, is am I making an impact in other sort of directions? So uh, this is sort of looking at the blog, where I actually sort of get out there and try to make science and entomology more accessible to a wider audience. So I have, uh, my la last count, I've written 180 articles since I went started blogging, uh, which compares with my scientific papers, I've done probably 220, 230. Uh, but I'm pretty certain that I'm getting a lot more readership on my blog than I am with my science papers. My, he most, my most cited paper, and I'm not as good as Mike Hassel, your president, your chair, who's, but my, my most cited paper has had 640 sites. I mean, it means more people have read it, but I'm pretty certain that I haven't had tens of thousands of people read that paper. I've had, uh, when I pre prepared this, which uh, the latest version I think I sent day before yesterday, uh, I'd had 88,000 visitors to my site and 137,000 views, people reading it. So, and if you look at that map, the only place that's white is Greenland, and I don't think they've got internet there. So, 
somebody in the whole world, everybody is sort of looking at what I'm doing. So I'm pretty certain I'm making an impact. Whether it's a positive impact or not, uh, I hope it is, and I think I have evidence for that. So this is, for example, this is a book uh, that he, the author contacted me and said, could he cite my blog and put it into, into his book? So that's, that's a win. Uh, I've had the opportunity to write for things that I might not normally write for. Yes, I'd probably write for Outlooks and Pest Management, uh, but sort of biosphere. I'd never sort of thought of writing for them. And the Institute of uh, International Association of Landscape it, uh, Ecologists asked me to write something for them on their thing. So, you know, I'm pretty certain I'm getting to a much wider audience. And if I'd stayed there as a, as a desperately angry entomologist, uh, not on social media. Uh, and sort of in a more professional sense, I'm also getting the opportunity to translate things from my blog into standard journals. So if you needed to justify to a head of department that what you were doing is useful, then yes, I think one can say uh, what I'm doing is useful. And just as a sort of uh, full circle, uh, so this, was, this is a collaboration. So this is a paper about, written by science bloggers about science blogging uh, and how useful it is. And these people, the only one I'd actually met in person uh, was Jeff Ollett, and everybody else came from this worldwide Twitter interaction. We sat down together and we, well, virtually sat down together using uh, the wonders of mo modern technology to produce a paper. And the Royal Society Open were so excited about the, the result of this paper that they asked us to write a blog about writing the paper about blogging. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, <laughs> and it was fun. Here's, here's a tweet from one of the authors saying how much fun it was. Uh, <laughs> it does take, if you do go into blogging, it takes time. You've got to work at it. This is Jeff Ollerton. Uh, you can see, although he's sort of quite famous in the pollinator world, it took time for his blog to take off. And I sort of put that down to the fact that he wasn't on Twitter to begin with. I was on Twitter when I started. I've got a different uh, line. If you don't work at it, so part of our MSc course, I make I don't make, I ask uh, the MSc students if they would like to, to run a blog, which is called Mastering Entomology. They're not as active on it as they might be, but even they are gradually building an audience. So there's a trend out there for going on to Twitter, getting your science out there, using it to promulgate science. So recording schemes, the longhorn beetles. If you are interested in longhorn beetles, they're out there on Twitter. Agrimized flies. Yep, they're out there. Weevils, if you're interested in weevils, you can record your weevils, talk about weevils. Pseudoscorpions, there's only 32 species, so I don't know how much recording they take, but there's a, there's a Twitter account out there collecting data, and the, the person who runs that is actually on the MSC uh, at the moment. Uh, ladybirds, Helen Roy, I think uh, is here, or going to be here, you know, part of the UK ladybird survey fantastic piece of citizen science, collecting data, encouraging people to send in data. Butterflies, of course, the Butterfly Conservation Trust are out there advertising what they do, how important butterflies are. Uh, and just so that you don't feel that like I'm totally biased for insects, my dad was a mycologist, so here you are. Fungi, you can record your fungi as well. Have fun with the fungi. Uh, and it's not just in sort of separate organisms. There's a phenology network out there collecting data, take, asking people to look out there, look at what's happening. When's leaf fall happening? When's fruiting happening? When's, you know, when the bud's bursting? Get that data in. Uh, and of course, there's you guys. You're out there on Twitter uh, <coughs> making, your, making your presence felt, asking people to contribute. And people asked, this, is, this could be a new recording scheme. This is Kate Bradbury, uh, a, a, a gardening journalist, asking people for information about leaf cutting bees and are they using roses. That could turn into a new recording initiative. Manu Saunders out in Australia, telling people, get into your backyards, let's have some, some more data come in. So uh, if you aren't a member of Twitter, then I suggest you do join Twitter. It's really, really useful. And if you're going to blog, then make sure you've got plenty of share buttons so that people can share what you're talking about. Share what you've, 
you, you found out. Share it all around the world, and then other people can tweet it as well, or Facebook it, or whatever. So finally, I'd just like to thank Franz Gontz for sort of uh, giving me that boot up the arse to get onto Twitter. All my blog, blog subscribers, which I'm surprised people do subscribe to it, they do. And I noticed I said that uh, I've got, uh, when I put this talk in, there were 5,720 followers on Twitter. It's now 5,728. Uh, so it goes up all the time. And the snipping tool is, is so useful. <coughs> Wow, what a talk about engagement and that's proper partnership working with the kind of in the widest sense of it, isn't it? Um, we, we've got some time for questions, so can I invite anybody to ask questions? Or you can tweet them if you really want to. <laughs> right. uh, a bit of a... <laughs> Uh, as a bit of an amateur photographer, I'm a member of six or seven photography groups on Facebook, and I'm often struck by literally thousands of posts that contain biological records. Mm. Do you know if there's any way of tapping into that? Uh, well, there's the, uh, there is an entomology group on um, Facebook who do lots of photos and things. So I guess if you spoke to them, or the, you know, there's Facebook groups for all sorts of uh, natural history things. Uh, so I'm sure. I'm sure there's some way of tapping into it through those. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, I think it's, I mean, I think parents are to blame, because like you say, I mean, when we have open days and things like that, and the kids at a certain age, I mean, the brownies, I, I gave a talk to some brownies recently, that was really horrific, they were so noisy, uh, and grabbing all my insects, um, but you, you do see parents sort of trying to pull the children back from touching these things, at a per, you know, and you think, look, you're a grown-up, you can see we're holding these things, and I know Ashley's seen this as well, uh, you're holding your hissing cockroach, uh, so, you, you know, you wouldn't be holding it if it was dangerous and showing it to kids, so, so why are the parents doing this? So I think it's a sort of learned behaviour that kids, most children are really curious about nature. I mean, I used to spend my whole time pulling bits off coconut trees and looking, looking for scorpions and things like this. No fear at all. Um, but then they go to, and I think primary school, they still, they still have, the interest is still engendered in them. And it, then they go to secondary school and they get it hammered out of them for some reason. They don't get exposed to nature as much. I don't know what's happening. They start to get some peer pressure. And I think uh, it takes a dedicated, uh, teenager to get through that time to still be an entomologist at the end of it. Uh, so, so yeah, we, what we do need to do is not just the children we need to educate, it's, it's the parents and it's the adults out there that, you know, this is where they should be at. It's not something to squash, not, not something to swat. Uh, and it's sort of getting, getting the parents early enough. <laughs> that, perhaps all, all new parents should go on a course, how to handle insects and make your kids like them. Or, you know, not, not scare your kids away, you know. You know, it's good to get dirty. <laughs> so, yeah. Question up at the back. Um, I'll just shout. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you'd ever have done any uh, sort of analysis of who your audience are on Twitter. Because um, think about the, I work very much from a public engagement point yeah. of view. And I think about things uh, like echo chambers, where social media yeah. kind of sends back a feedback loop of mm. the things that you're already interested in. So is it breaking beyond that boundary of just talk, still talking to other people who are already interested? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, Twitter, there's a thing called Twitter analytics, but that really just tells you about sort of demographics and income brackets and what, what phone they use. Um, but if I look at my um, sort of Twitter base, there are definitely people, uh, yes, a, a lot of them are 
civilians who are interested in nature, as it were. Uh, but there are definitely people who uh, I have interacted through other groups on Twitter that have sort of become interested in what we're doing. So I think it does have a, have a, uh, uh, you know, it, you, it's not a complete echo chamber. It is sort of got tendrils going out there. And the fact that I was talking, for example, and I think the blog is also a good example of how that, that really does get uh, a lot of other people. So um, one of my most sort of hit upon blog posts is, uh, are aph not, all, not all aphids are vegans. Uh, and I notice that I get a lot of, at uh, certain times of year, a lot of people sort of click on that because they're interested, because they're being bitten by an aphid. You didn't know aphids bit people, but they do. Um, and so th th you get people that way. And the fact that I was talking at a conference, an English literature conference the weekend before last shows you that I'm getting out to audiences who, you know, who you wouldn't normally reach in the circumstances. So yeah, I think it, it, it's not just an echo chamber. Well, thank you. I think we'll um, have to leave it there, move on, but thank thanks very much.